Uh, my name is uh, Amy Davis. I'm the Associate Director of the Canadian Film Centre's Media Lab, which is based in Toronto. Uh, that means very loosely that I oversee a lot of the digital programming that happens at the Canadian Film Centre. So I have the pleasure of introducing creators like yourselves to new technologies, whether that's virtual reality or to new platforms, whether that's YouTube or Netflix, and to help them grow sustainable businesses and properties that essentially make money. So which leads me to the whole premise of this particular session, which is branded entertainment. And if it's a viable model, what it means, what it looks like, what's a measurement of success. Now, I've been asked over the last couple of days, uh, both Matt and I, who I'll introduce in a moment, what exactly is branded entertainment? So would anyone like to shout out an answer to that? Or I'll call on Jesse. <laughs> <laughs> Would you like to give everyone an example of what, what is branded entertainment, Jesse? You know this more than, uh, more than anyone. Exactly, right. But it, sh it should be entertaining. And I think, you know, s someone asked me, is it product placement? Well, no, it isn't product placement. It's way beyond that now. And we've, we've completely evolved the landscape. And, and what we're going to be doing in this session is actually showing you some examples of fantastic branded entertainment done across an array of platforms. So if we could pull up our slides... We will be covering... A range of topics and I want to keep this interactive so do feel free to throw out questions on each but we're going to be looking at defining branded content creative versus media agencies ie where's the money coming from social media touches the first screen and the experience economy so again feel free to make this as interactive as possible but it's not going to be me answering all these questions luckily I have brought an expert with me today um, I have known Matt for too long, I think. Probably. And we have, we've done this conversation uh, before, I think, about four years ago. But the conversation has, of course, evolved, which is something that we're going to touch on as well. So Matt, um, you know, Matt is actually a mentor at the Canadian Film Centre. He helps advise uh, our creative companies on how they can uh, work with the advertising industry. He is also the managing director of digital innovation for a really well-known uh, agency called Sid Lee. And he's actually worked um, with brands Sportcheck, Adidas, Facebook, to name uh, just a few. So I'm going to introduce and hand over to Matt DePaolo. Thanks. Cool. That was a good intro, right? You're welcome. So thanks, everyone, for uh, showing up at 9 a.m. on a... Uh, <laughs> what is it? Thursday? Are you on Thursday? Thursday. Thank you. Um, We've got a lot of content to go through, so we'll, we'll try and uh, get through as much as we can. We've got a bunch of videos, a bunch of case studies, because we wanted to cover a really broad spectrum. Um, as Amy said, we've known each other far too long. We've been doing these kind of conversations uh, in Toronto, in Banff, uh, at South By with, with Jesse, actually, at one point. So uh, if at any point you feel like we're going too deep on something, you want us to move on, just tell us. It's OK. We won't. Thank you, Jesse. <laughs> yeah, Moving on. You will. Um, <laughs> Just to frame up, I think, you know, when we look at branded content and, and the breadth of it, uh, I want to show you a portion of uh, the, the Sidley reel, just because for me it kind of gives context with like, how big the space is. I won't play it all because it probably runs a bit long, but I'll play just the, the first little bit. A mobile app, an epic TV ad, a social community, a global event, an exhibition, a retail experience. What do these things have in common? To us, they're one and the same. They're all moments of truth that define your brand. By mixing creative disciplines, we develop transformative experiences and it's what propels us forward.
sorry, I was trying to cut it there. Um, I, just, I wanted to show, I didn't want this to be you know, too much of a Sid Lee thing, but I wanted to, when we kind of frame this, when we look at branded content and branded entertainment, it, it's not just about films, it's not just about TV, it's about you know, the proliferation of, of devices, um, uh, technology, and also real life events and experiences that we, you know, where brands are trying to connect with people across uh, all of them. So I think I want to kind of open up the spectrum uh, on that to kind of just show the wide range when we look at what branded content is. Um, when we kind of jump in, I want kind of, before we jump into examples and some of the stuff that Amy uh, talked about, I want to do a little bit of a history lesson on you know why are we why is branded content such a thing right now? Why is content the buzzword? Why is everyone talking about it? And I want to do a little bit of a history lesson to set that up. When we look at branded content uh, and where it all started, it's it's not far off from what you know years ago when when TV really took off and you know Procter and Gamble you know created the soap opera and you know created another world which you know ran for 50 odd years and made a lot of money for P&G as a production company as well as uh, you know a soap selling and detergent selling company as well and that kind of set the framework for how you know creating content to sell product really you know is kind of not that far from what we're doing today we just have more choices the reality was you know over time that that model started to break down because you know we started seeing we had more choices. We had PVR. We had on-demand services. We had people pirating. We, we had all these ways that people could control how to watch their content, and also how to ignore advertising. And so the models, you know, the models have started to break down. In addition to that, you've now got multiple devices. And so you know, and we're going to talk a little bit of you know this touch-first or this mobile-first look. A lot of people in the in the film and TV community are still designing uh, second screen apps or, or calling it second screen, thinking that the, the mobile device or the tablet is the second screen. And in reality, we're seeing that the, de the device closest to you, the device that's in your hand and tactile and an extension of you is actually the first screen. And the, the TV uh, in the background is actually becoming the, the second screen. So that's changing a lot of how people are interacting with content. And we just generally see that like, people have this attitude. Like, the, people, the world doesn't want more advertising. No one, I don't think anyone, even in the advertising community, wants more advertising. So how do we find ways to connect with people in an emotional way to tell stories uh, so they don't feel like we're interrupting our, the experience they're trying to have. So when we look at all that, you know, in, from the marketing side, we've always done, you know, from a traditional standpoint, the insight and desire. You know, a lot of what we do is, is digging into consumer research, understanding the insights, understanding the, the, the needs of, of what the consumer is want, trying to find that desire. How do we connect them? How do we find out what they want so we can find that way to connect, connect with them? And then I think in the last... 20 years with, with technology and the internet, this level of utility and, and software has, has come into, okay, we have to make this useful. It's not just about throwing messaging in front of them. We have to give them something that they can use. So in our, you know, in our world, this has translated into making sure we've got great strategy and great story, but also leveraging that technology angle. And in the last 10 years, you know, the big change has been adding this level of social media and this participation. I think the, you know, we're seeing a whole generation of, of millennials that don't want to buy things. You know, they're, they're talking about the you know, the the effect that the the cloud is having on you know people's behaviors. No one wants to own media anymore. They don't even want to own a DVD. They don't want to own uh, a, a series. They can they they will just have it in the cloud and they'll access it when they want and they'll rent it. And that that, that the value of the experiencing something is, is has a higher value in their in their world than actually the ownership. So when we look at and, and so we were talking a lot. You know, there's a lot of examples of who's doing this well, who's setting the stage. And I think when we, when we look at, realistically, someone who indisputably uh, owns the market on the, uh, you know, is you look at Lego. I mean, there is a, as a toy company that, for all intents and purposes, could have been irrelevant. You know, a plastic toy that had no relevance to technology, had no relevance to anything. And, and they went through such an incredible uh, you know, reinvigoration of the brand to connect with people and become relevant again. And now, I mean, you know, between, you know, yes, their movie was a 90 minute ad, but it was entertaining as hell. Like it, it was awesome. People loved it. They've got video games. They've got, you know, this whole idea of how you can bring people into the story through the, the Lego movie, the, the create your own Lego figure and get people engaged in the storyline. You've got Lego lands popping up everywhere for like those real life experiences. Lego movie party ideas, like who, you know, who would have thought? And then obviously, you know, the, the, the toys, which are the back. So, when we start to talk about brand entertainment and brands that get the fact that they can still 
monetize every piece of their media. That, that this one we kind of kind of want to put out there as a as a key example. So with that, uh, Amy, I don't know if you want to come in. Let's kind of start off with the what is branded content. Absolutely. So. What is branded content? And we touched on this, uh, you know, just a moment ago with Jesse's definition as well. So we just want to show you some different and varying examples. And one that we want to touch on, first of all, I had the pleasure of, um, of going out to L.A. and I met uh, uh, Mark Crumpacker, who's the CMO of Chipotle. And uh, they recently had run a series on Hulu called Farmed and Dangerous. Now, you, you'll look at this series, we'll show you a clip right now, and whilst you might consider it to be unbranded in a sense, I mean, their, their brand isn't present, their logo isn't present, but it does touch on the brand's ethos of a sustainable agriculture. So their messaging is running through it, and they've, ma they've managed to successfully marry that to the content, and in a very uh, humorous way, let me add. So has anyone seen Farmed and Dangerous? A couple of you. Okay, perfect. So I'm just going to show you a clip. I think you'll enjoy. Why am I here? This is the biggest improvement in agriculture since synthetic growth hormones. What is petrol pellet? It's a game changer. Petrol pellet? You're feeding cattle petroleum? Nobody wants oil in the food chain. I'm well, sure they do. Oil, oil, oil. Side effects? Do they know what caused the car to explode? If it wasn't jihad, I would put my money on the petroleum. That's not what we're thinking, all right? They pay us to fix their image, not their cattle. You're supposed to make sure this thing doesn't get out. Google yeah. Adam Oil cow explosion video. Why are my cows exploding all over the internet? <laughs> <laughs> so the say was promoting that video. The young man behind the number one this is Chip Randolph. Thanks for having me. You're just a farmer. I'm part of an organization that's committed to better farming practices. And that's terrific. But why create a viral video of a cow explosion? That's actual security footage from an animal. Only well, we could find some way to get through to him. Someone who could charm him. How can you suggest this? You're my dad. I would never suggest it as your dad. As your employer, however. This fighting and that's good. Is yeah. So that gives you a good sense of the series, I think, and it's been hugely successful for them. And, and you know, and actually Chipotle have done a number of, uh, uh, of different pieces before, so they're a good brand to take a look at. They definitely get it. Cool. Uh, the other example, I think, you know, again, as we kind of take you through this journey, we want to kind of set a few clear examples of like straightforward branded content. Uh, one of the ones that we worked on, so GSP is, uh, was one of our clients. He actually came to Sidley uh, because he himself wanted to, you know, evolve his brand, uh, and so we, you know, as we were going through this exercise with him, you know, it wasn't just about, you know, a logo and you know a press release or, or publicity. You know, as we kind of dug into working with him, we, there was a, there was a much bigger story to tell, and we also realized, you know, because of his kind of stature as a Canadian in the MMA, it, we you know we felt there was a story to tell that uh, was relevant to all Canadians. So we actually worked with him to create a 90-minute documentary uh, and a book that became, you know, branded content about GSP. Oops. One of the reasons, before I kind of talk about these two, one of the reasons we want to show these two examples, when you start to look at 
kind of the, the world of storytelling and you know, video content, whether it's on the web, whether it's in the theater or on TV, is seen to be falling in two facets. One, you know, the first one, Farm and Dangerous, very entertaining. Obviously, that type of humor works really well uh, online and, and you know, really plays that, you know, the YouTube audience. And then the documentary style, and I think you know, the, the one word you may have caught, depending on you know, with his French accent and all this authentic. Yes. Um, but I think the, this idea of authenticity uh, you see a lot of brands that you know want to get into to tell stories. They struggle with like, they don't want to have just a 90-minute sell. It, it, in order to engage, so you have to find that voice and that authenticity and what that story is to tell and, and find a way to tell. So we we find like what and we kind of look at you know both Red Bull and Subway, who are also very active in the space. Red Bull is very authentic to uh, to who they are. The content they create is about extreme sports, which is what the brand stands for, and and people are okay engaging with it because. It is true who they are, and then Subway on the other side, it's it's entertaining. Like they are, they are playing in a space where it's kind of funny, and yeah. yeah, it makes sense. And one question I asked Matt is, okay, so you you want to work with a brand? How do you find that authentic voice? Uh, like, what should you be asking yourself, whether you're the creator or whether you're the brand? And you know, you you do follow a certain process in that respect. So, would you mind outlining that? Like, how do you find the very core of the brand and how that can be represented as a story? Yeah, I mean, I think, it, 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 I mean, for us, um, I would kind of for two, I'll answer that question on twofold. I think one is we get a lot of, you know, there's a lot of producers and a lot of people come and pitch and it's like, I have this idea and it would be great for brand X to be part of. And, you know, they've done, the, either they just have an idea and they're looking for anyone to fund it and they, you know, are just kind of, kind of spray shooting, that they're, they're pitching to anyone that will listen, or... They've, they've kind of looked out there and you know, tried to figure out what the brand voice is based on either the other advertising and, and made a guess. It really does become a conversation and a, and a relationship that needs to happen with uh, the agencies who work on those brands or, or the brands themselves to understand what is the brand's purpose. The, the, the most successful brands in the world do go through an exercise of like, why do they exist? If they were not gonna exist tomorrow, would the world actually care? And, and they, they should have a purpose that is that is higher than the, the products they're trying to sell. If you can figure that out and have that conversation either with you know, the CMOs or the VP of marketing or the, the, the agency strategy people who work on those brands, that will be really insightful to, for you to tailor your pitch on, on, on how that can fit in. Because every year a brand's gonna have a number of campaigns and a number of business priorities, but they're all still rooted in what the, what the brand's purpose is and building on that. Thanks. Next topic. So, actually, this follows on very nicely. So, this is the creative versus media agency. So, what that means is, how do you source funding? Who do you approach? Uh, what is it? How does the approach differ when you go to a creative agency versus a media agency? And also, just something that we'll touch on is, how can you go to direct to a brand? Uh, is that ever a possible avenue? So, you're going to touch on this. Yeah. So, uh, we've got two examples we're going to talk. One is. Uh, how a creative agency approached a problem, one is how a media agency approached uh, an opportunity. And, and we'll, I'll show a brief clip, I won't show the whole thing again, and then I'll kind of talk about the difference between the two. So this, this is the creative one first. There are pockets of our society that are not just broken, but frankly sick. In September 2011, we began a grassroots campaign to enable London youth. 32 talents from London's 32 boroughs became our 2012. A series of 32 documentaries and local borough printouts showcased their skills. A track telling their story became a TV ad inspiring others to do the same. Celebrities laid down the challenge. I'm giving you the opportunity to open up for me on tour. And an online platform gave them the chance to step up. So when it came time for Team GB to take the stage, teenagers knew what it felt like. So that, that's an overview. Just kind of quick again, I want to kind of make sure we get through all the examples. That, so in that example, from a creative standpoint, um, is Adidas was trying to solve a problem. So again, the insight was how do we engage youth uh, in the Olympics and get them talking about it? And they did that through you know, 
by identifying people at a local level and, and getting them to create documentaries to get the, the we're going. The creative agency came up with the idea. Okay, they did the, they got the insight, they came up with the idea, sold the idea into the client, but then they worked with uh, the film community to actually partner to help bring those stories to life. I think in a, in a lot of cases, the agencies, you know, their, their value proposition is really being able to come up with the idea, but they do need to partner out in the world to actually bring the stories and, and work with professional storytellers to make sure that the, uh, these stories are being told authentically. Um, the other example here, so Battle of the Blades, this was done by a media agency. Um, you may not know this because it may not seem like it's there's, there's not a lot of product placements, there's not a lot of brands built into it, but there, there's a company, you may have heard them, there's a you know, big holding company called WPP, one of the, the big uh, ad agency holding companies in the world, and they, their media division is called Group M Entertainment. And Group M, or it's called Group M, sorry. And then within Group M, they've got Mediacom, Maxis, Mindshare, there's, there's another one, I always forget the fourth one. Uh, and they have this Group M Entertainment uh, run by a guy by the name of Peter Tortorici. So you should all look him up, so if you have ideas to pitch him. Um, and he actually runs uh, a product, essentially a production studio. They've got money to green light productions, and they find these productions uh, that, that they, they work to produce with, you know, with producers. Producers, they take a minority stake of IP in it uh, as an executive producer to, to fund it, like a like any studio would, and then they work with the media agencies they have and the brands that they represent to basically go to networks saying, okay, we've got this, we, we've got this fully funded product, we've got the advertisers, and you know we're one of your biggest buyers of media space. Let's negotiate airtime to run this content. And Battle of the Blades uh, was something that Group M. Uh, produced and worked with CBC to, to put out there and they made their money on from an executive producer standpoint and they also made their money on uh, their agencies being able to sell the advertising in the show and that was a different that, that's how media agencies work so I think again when you're looking at taking ideas forward or how to pitch ideas the creative agencies really want like they're looking for guns for hire they, they want they, they their their IP is the ideas they're not looking for other ideas in the marketplace they're looking for people to help them help them tell the stories that they've sold into the brands. The media agencies are absolutely looking for IP, but they're also looking, their, their way to monetize is an audience. So they're trying to figure out how can they create something to get as many eyeballs as possible and be able to monetize that. Uh, Peter Tortorici. Other, other, you know, we, we... What's that? T-O-R-T-I-C-I-N-I, isn't it? Tortorici? Yeah. And if you look him up on, and just if, you, if you look up Group M Entertainment, he'll he should come up as the lead on it. And another, you know, touching on other similar media agencies, uh, where else should they be looking? Ogilvy. Yeah, I mean, o I mean Ogilvy Entertainment, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, they're they're looking at stuff. They're also part of WPP. They're they're creating some series. That a lot of the media agencies are certainly getting into this business because again, as we kind of talked about earlier, as the world starts to fragment more, and you know, it's getting harder and harder to reach people. They're looking for new ways to, to get at it. Uh, Group M is probably the most sophisticated at it at this point, but I yes. think the, the other, uh, the Omnicom and the OMDs of the world uh, are following suit. It, does anyone in the audience, uh, has anyone here successfully secured a brand funded deal they'd like to share? No? That's why we're here, so it's fine. Just a case. <laughs> um, so thirdly, going direct to a brand. I get asked this all the time. Can I just call up the CMO of Coke and pitch him? Absolutely, you can try. Um, <laughs> you can go, right? Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I think you know, it's, it's uh, you know, much like an event like VIF or, or other industry events. Networking is a huge part of it. And if you can get out there and get to events and and meet people over a a cocktail conversation where it's less of a sell and, and build those relationships over time, that is helpful. The the reality is, you know, you talk like the CMO of Coke or, or any big brand. They are getting pitched like a million times a day from agencies trying to steal business from each other, uh, you know, Hollywood trying to get product places. The, the amount of people that want money from the brands, like they, 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 they don't have time to even respond to most of that stuff. Um, in a lot of cases, the bigger brands, if they have a healthy relationship with their agency, they'll just defer you to the agency anyway um, to, to vet it for them and bring stuff forward that, that makes sense. If they don't have a healthy relationship with the agency, then that's possibly a way in. Um, you know, there are some agencies that are still running very traditional work for clients, and as clients are getting more savvy, 
they're not getting what they need and, and they start to look outside. Um, I think the, the other, you know, the brands you can probably look at if you, if you really uh, want to try the angle are more challenger brands. Don't ever go after the top marketer in a vertical. Go after the second or third place one. I think you know, that's, that's why Red Bull's been able to do such a great job because they were able to create, you know, they came up from under Coke and Pepsi with this energy drink and created their own category and could, and could do it without anyone uh, you know, pushing on them. I think we look at a few years ago when uh, it was um, did you know, Old Spice, did all the Old Spice work o- online that got a lot of talk is because Old Spice was about to be delisted. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, when a brand's about to be taken off the shelf, then they can start to take chances. Those are the ones you want to kind of go out there and pitch because they're a little more open to, to risk. Plus, this is prime time. I mean, most marketers understand the value of content marketing like never before right now. So it's it's definitely an opportune time to start looking in this space. Um, just something to really to touch on very quickly is, uh, you know, we also look at the lingo of, uh, you know, the advertising world versus, you know, the, the media production world, right? Okay, fantastic. You get a meeting with Peter Tortosini at, at Group M. You're in front of him. But there's certain metrics... Uh, there's certain numbers that he is going to want to see, or you're going to be out of that door as fast as you came in. So can you talk a little bit about the language and the metrics that the ad world needs to see? Absolutely. I think, you know, the, it was interesting for me, and you know, we talked a little bit about the, the years that Amy and I have been, you know, having these conversations. And it was enlightening, you know, going to BAMP for a few years and being pitched by a number of uh, people in the space because, they, you know, they often were pitching me like they would be pitching a film studio. He's like, here are the characters, here's the story arc, here's, you know, here's where I see this going, you know, how it's going to all happen and come to life. And quite honestly, we don't care. Like, yeah, that's great that there's a story and it's great that there's, <laughs> there's, there's rich characters. But at the end of the day, uh, we want to reach an audience. So I think you know, the, the questions that, come, that we need to see is like, who is this, who cares about this story? What is the size of the potential audience? How are you going to reach them? What is your marketing and publicity strategy? Um, those are the things you're going to get asked. And I think, you know, in a, you know, in a media standpoint, a lot of the times they're not going to, they may not help you fund something that doesn't already exist. They may look at something, okay, you've already got uh, an audience online of this many, we'll help you take that to the next level. But if you've got nothing and you're starting from scratch, it's going to be a very hard sell. Mm-hmm, absolutely. Which leads nicely into our... Next one. <laughs> Social. Uh, yeah, well, and we just touched on this, H- how important it is to be able to demonstrate that you're going to be able to achieve an audience, or the other route is to already have an audience that you can demonstrate. So we want to talk a little bit about some of the folks that have been, uh, that have been very successful with uh, branded entertainment online. Yeah, I mean, I think in two very, I mean, two very real examples, uh, equally, well, maybe more, uh, Epic is probably a little bit more successful nowadays, but... Uh, E- you know, equally success in the place, and, and probably if you're starting out with an idea, likely the route to follow. They both started on YouTube. Um, they created, you know, they created their own shows. They they bootstrapped it. They got funding. They, they they made their content. They were able to monetize that content through their YouTube partnerships uh, and be able to get ad revenue from from YouTube. And over time, as they built their audience and as they you know engaged in social, and, you know, Nadia G on on Bitch and Kitchen, I mean, she was active in the Twitter space. She was talking to people, she was responding to people, she was, she was kind of nur- nurturing that audience until you know, they finally got a big show deal in the US and they've got cookbooks now. Um, the Epic Mealtime guys, I mean, who would have thought you know, people who created a concept based on a, you know, the, this is why you're fat blog um, and creating these crazy recipes, uh, you know, who would have thought they would have had the success they've had? You know, I think one of the interesting metrics for me on this one, so not only that you know, they, they found an audience and they built an audience, they're also able to see from an analytics standpoint through Google and YouTube that every time the word bacon appeared in the, the title of one of their videos, their numbers were infinitely higher than the, the non-bacon uh, episodes. So they're like, all right, we're the bacon guys. We are just going to make, because they were able to make, you know, they were yeah. making bacon and yeah. able to monetize that and make a lot of money off that. And now they've, they've, got, they've got a show down in the U.S. again. And, and then they, they got well. maple. Yeah. They bacon, got maple, what they a got lovely maple fit. And, and, that, and that was exactly it. I mean, once they kind of became the bacon people, they had the power to go to you know Maple Leaf and say, yeah. "We've got this much audience. We are we own the bacon conversation online. You can be part of this, or we'll just go to the next person that sells bacon and ask them." <laughs> 
And I mean, well, there's, there's, you know, there's definitely more examples as well. The CFC is actually um, running an event in a couple of weeks exactly to this point where we're going to be looking at some of these successful YouTube creators and how they've managed to amass... Uh, you know, millions and millions of, of followers. And there's, you know, similar is take a look at Rhett and Link. They do a ton of work with brands. You know, they started on YouTube. Now they have their own established production company. They have brands flocking to them to integrate, uh, to be able to be in front of their audiences. Yeah, we I mean, when I, at a previous agency, we worked with Rhett and Link years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and again, we were working with a brand, uh, Alka-Seltzer, that was clearly not relevant to anyone that wasn't already old and, and getting close to death, so their, their audience is literally <laughs> dying off. Um, and they, you know, they need to find a way to be relevant. And, and we, you know, we partnered with Rhett and Link, and we sent them on a US tour of you know, food trucks and just really crazy barbecue festivals. Uh, and they weaved Alka-Seltzer in, in a fun way into the story. And, and again, it, it made it relevant and people engaged with it because they had a younger audience, which is what Alka-Seltzer needed to do. Mm -hmm. um, we look at you know, it's got a few other kind of top lines. We look at how a brand approaches it. You know, again, some simple ways to engage in uh, in social. Uh, when when Audi launched their R8, I mean, such an aspirational car, so many people wanted it. Uh, they realized that people uh, on Twitter were, were already using a hashtag called "Want an R8." Like people were like just were, were talking about it. Everyone wanted this car. They didn't have enough of them. Obviously, it's super expensive. So what they then decided to take advantage of this this existing behavior, they created a, a campaign where as people put this hashtag out there into the world, they would show up on their doorstep in the morning with an R8 and they'd be able to drive an R8 for 24 hours. And they, they rigged the car with, with, with cameras and they, and they created documentary content about people engaging with the R8 and it, it gave them a bunch of uh, more content to push out there in the, into the social space. Uh, AT&T's done a lot of stuff. Yeah, they did, they did an online summer series last year where you could follow a bunch of students on, the, on their summer vacation across all the different social channels. So again, this, this appeared across the, the, you know, Tumblr and Twitter and Facebook, and again, in the, in the, in the platforms where the audience was engaging. Because again, AT&T has a vested interest in getting people to use more devices and use their mobile phones. So they want people watching content on their phones and tablets. Um, this, this next one I'm gonna show you, uh, you know, we, we worked with Facebook uh, to launch the Messenger product in Mexico. This is the true story of Chris, who had never left his hometown and how 1,520,000 people showed him an entire country. This is Small Town Boy, a journey around Mexico using just the Messenger app. Chris's journey began on the Facebook Mexico homepage where people were invited to decide where he would go, give him tips on what to do, or even meet him in person. We documented his journey live as old and new friends reached out to him on the timeline, a separate personal page, and on Messenger itself. Thanks to these connections, he discovered new places, met new people, and experienced amazing new things. For an entire month, we responded to every comment while Chris shared his experiences live through private messages, status updates, and photo albums. At every destination, we shot, edited, shared, and released a documentary with just a 24-hour turnaround. Millions of people connected with him in real time and even more downloaded the app, all to take part in Chris's journey. Es bien padre conocer a tantas personas. Los que conocemos la historia, pues nos emocionamos un poco y dijimos, tenemos que conocer. In the end, it wasn't just a boy learning about the country he lived in, but a country learning something about itself. La gente siempre dice que México te recibe con los brazos abiertos. Ustedes me demostraron que eso es muy cierto. You know, I think one of the really, yeah. oh, thanks. Uh, one, one of the really, you know, maybe subtle comments in, in the video, I think when one thing we wanted to call out too is, um, I think hopefully you heard them say that they responded to every single uh, comment on Facebook and, and, and engaged the audience. I mean, and I think, you know, we've had a lot of conversations like the, the importance of social, the importance of engaging in the space is, is crucial to your business. Mm -hmm. 
um, you know, we, we, we've been talking to a lot of people, a lot of actors um, who, you know, they are losing roles because they don't have enough Twitter followers. Yeah. And studios are making decisions based on how many people, you know, how big their following is because they know that's now going to be marketing for, for their films. Um, and we're also seeing actors on the same, you know, on the same thing. They, when they create these audiences and, and you know, they're, they're able to get other gigs that like they're getting, like, there's, I know actors that are, you know, kind of, they're very character type actors. They, they work in probably you know, more of the sci-fi, uh, and comic con type of genres. And, you know, they're making more money, uh, going to the comic cons because they've got these big Twitter followers and they can, you know, people want them to come show up at these events and, and have these real life engagements with them. So I think, you know, if you're going to, you, you need to engage in the social space, but you need to actually commit to, you know, being active and, and getting out there and getting involved in the conversation. I think, and the, and the big thing is, it's it's like a party. I think the exactly. the, the key thing is just imagine yourself. It's, it's just another cocktail party, it's another event where you're you're just having a conversation. No one wants to be sold yeah. at a, at a cocktail party. No one wants to be yeah. sold online. Just just get engaged. But it lasts 24 hours every day <laughs> yeah. for the rest of your life. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. Um, mobile. Should we, run, should we run the clip first? Yeah, absolutely. This just because we thought this part, this way through the presentation, we might need a good just laugh. Set it up. Exactly. You're part of Generation Connect. Whether it's email, text, or mobile web, you're jacked in 24-7. Online, all the time, wherever you are. But being so connected has its disadvantages. <laughs> Until now. Introducing Heads Up from WorldTel. Sending you real-time, instant messages about what's in front of your face. Get closer to the people you love. Get out there. Get moving in the right direction. So when life gets in the way, get heads up and get back to business with Heads Up from WorldTel. Always be there. I'm going to patent that app right now. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's true, though, isn't it? Absolutely true. And then and so going back to Matt's point earlier, you know, it's not always the television that is the first screen. In fact, it isn't necessarily the television that is the first screen in this day and age, as so uh, aptly pointed out, so. Yeah, and I think, you know, mobile, I think every client we have right now is trying to figure out their, and, and sort out their mobile strategy, because, you know, we're seeing across the board, whether it's, you know, a car company, whether it's a bank, whether it's a, a consumer packaged good, 60% um, of the traffic to their website is coming from mobile devices and smartphones. And a lot of them don't have mobile-friendly sites, so, that, so that's that's a big fix that's happening in our business. But you know, it's a behavior, and I think you know, as we start to, as, as we as content producers uh, look at that device and, and that behavior, how do we kind of revisit how we approach what we're doing and think of content in different ways? You know, it's not just about you know long-form storytelling or short or short-form video storytelling. There's other ways to engage people in in content. You know, you look at there's, there's a, a bank in, I think it's in West Australia or New Zealand called Westpac, uh, and they, you know, they created this little fuel gauge app that connects to your, your savings account. So when you're shopping and you're like, should I buy those shoes, should I not buy those shoes? It's a one click, and it's basically telling you how empty or full your bank account is in a very quick icon, and, and they've been able to put that onto a smartwatch already. So again, it's, it's going with where the technology is going and where people are going to create these uh, great uses. Uh, we've done some work with with Videotron, and you know, several years ago, they they saw this trend happening. They realized that you know a bunch of their customers were moving into mobile, and they didn't have content. So they uh, they wanted to create a mobile television network, basically. This one's a little racier, but it's great. Picard, 
Tout à spotter la viande tout de suite, hein? And I think, you know, <laughs> had to show something with some swearing and some nudity Absolutely. in it, right? So, at least once. Um, but I think when you start to look at the mobile space, I mean, I think, you know, you know, obviously a lot of the Canadian industry depends on, you know, there, there's grants uh, and tax credits in the space. And as this, as we're catching up in this space, you know, there's a lot of innovation funding that's pushing to get content because people are using their mobile phones and people are, are trying to create stuff for that. So I think it's another opportunity again to, to rethink if you've got some ideas on how to approach it from a, from a mobile first standpoint. I think you, you coined it uh, appropriately, which is a 360 approach, right? Not necessarily mobile or television, but really looking at your content holistically uh, in light of where your audiences are and what technologies and what platforms can be utilized, right, to meet those yeah. needs. I'll skip over the next one because it's just really the, the, that oh, after three years, it's evolved into an actual t it, uh, onto TV, and there's a TV series now about people pitching ideas for the mobile show. And it's, uh, it's funny, but I want to get through, make sure we get through stuff and get to Q&A. Um, so th that kind of leads us to that, that last section. You kind of look at this, this 360, this so many platforms uh, and so many stories. I, again, we need to start to rethink on how we're, we're using all these things. Um, this next one, I'm going to show you, it's, uh, it's done from a local Vancouver company uh, called Thinking Box. They are doing a ton of great work uh, with the film studios uh, around Oculus Rift uh, and 3D virtual reality. And uh, I mean, I think Jesse's already heard enough from me about this one. And as is Amy, because I saw this case study, and I was like, these guys get it. Like, the, the, the whole idea of being able to now put people into the story and actually into, you know, become a character in this virtual reality is starting to become a little bit more accessible. So I'll just, uh, I'll play their case study, which is awesome. Most, the average film going experience is completely passive. So, for the film Into the Storm, we created an immersive 4D activation featuring the Oculus Rift DK2. We invited users into a custom booth that included gusts of wind and intense bass rumbling as we put the user in a scene inspired by the film. They were then able to share a live feed of the experience with their social networks. And this is how we made it. We started with a glass booth that housed four industrial fans that ramped up to 1400 RPM, two 80 PSI air compressors overhead, and beneath each seat were 1000 watt low frequency audio transducers for body shaking bass rumbles. We incorporated visual effects including 3D models and digital set pieces from the actual film. Character animations were accomplished through motion capture via Kinect technology. The scene was built using the Unity game engine for its real-time physics and tight integration with the Oculus Rift SDK. The Unity simulation, content servers and Arduino controllers were all seamlessly integrated and housed within the glass booth. And this is the result. San Diego Comic Con, the activation has traveled across the US, down to Latin America, and over the Atlantic to Europe. Almost immediately, the activation generated a large buzz via online articles, industry blogs, social media, and word of mouth. With the Into the Storm hashtag reaching almost 7 million impressions and counting. The results are clear that movie fans were thrilled to become a part of the film.
So for, yeah, for those of you that haven't played with a, oops, sorry, <laughs> forgot about that part. For those of you that haven't played with an, with an Oculus yet, I mean, it literally is when you're wearing it and you, and you are looking around, like you are, you are seeing a pair of feet, you're seeing, you, you're seeing, you are actually, you, you think you're in the world everywhere you look. And uh, it's, you know, it's pretty impressive. We've been working with another company uh, called Bubble Cam, um, and you know, they've done this great, you know, Bubble Cam is like a 360 camera that works kind of like a GoPro, but it, it shoots like Google Street View all the way around you. And they have this great skydiving demo um, that as you're, you know, as you're, you jump on the plane you, and you definitely get that floating sensation, but as you're coming to the ground, you feel the ground coming, you actually want to start running because you, you feel like you're about to hit. It's, it's unbelievable where this stuff is going. And then uh, mm. CFC. And we actually yeah. use the bubble cam to help us shoot the next piece of footage. So I couldn't resist showing you guys uh, another Oculus experience. So we did the uh, digital extension of the David Cronenberg Evolution exhibition called Body Mind Change, where uh, people were able to get a personal uh, implant, a biotech implant, which then personalized to your mind and was able to uh, grow in intelligence. So needless to say, it's a David Cronenberg-esque piece. So uh, it's a little bit freaky. You don't have the video. Oh, no. no. Oh, I'll just mime it. That was great. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Well, well yeah, we couldn't get, I couldn't get it. Oh, damn. Oh, I'll have, well, if anyone wants it, come and come. We'll tweet and, uh, it later, right? We'll, we'll tweet it later. It's really, really good. And uh, yeah, if you're in Toronto, I'll, I'll put it on the Oculus for you. Um, again, some other examples of people creating brand new content in different ways. Uh, as Oreo, is, again, has tried to be relevant again and, and reintroduce itself. They've done you know, a bunch of great content pieces uh, to get out there. Uh, this one at South by earlier this year, they created a machine that could 3D print Oreos based on, on tweets. So they get, you, know, you, you would tweet them, they'd, they'd print it, and you actually come in, and it was an edible Oreo of a 3D printer. So again, a great way to kinda, for them to create content and, and tell a story about it at the same time. Um, this British Airways uh, out of home, digital out of home ad uh, ran near Heathrow, and what happens is they were able to pull data from all the different, uh, from, from their airline feeds. So as a plane was flying over that billboard, that kid was actually pointing to the plane and the actual flight number that was flying over it. So again, like the integration of, of data and real time and content, there's, there's again, there's interesting ways to, to connect these pieces. Uh, again, kind of looking at the, at the mobile space, um, you know, Nivea did this thing. So, a lot of people go on vacation. You know, certainly in, in Vancouver, it rains a lot. Toronto, it snows a lot. We, we need our sun, right? But there's nothing worse than going on a sunny vacation and, you know, getting up early to, to maximize the sun and all of a sudden it's raining. And so now you're, you haven't slept in and there's no sun. So Nivea actually, you know, again, based on an insight that people do get pissed off about this, uh, they created an alarm clock app that's integrated into the weather forecast of your location. So you can set the alarm for like 6, 7 a.m., but if, if it's calling for rain, they're going to shut it off automatically and let you sleep. That's fantastic. Uh, there's, yeah, there's, there's another one. I can't remember the name of the brand, but they, they created a, uh, a skiing app. So that, you know, there's a lot of people who want to get out there you know, and be the first ones to, to hit fresh powder. And so same thing. If there, if there was snow overnight, it would wake you up early to let you know that you know, there, there was a snowfall and they get out onto the mountain. This whole, this whole idea of integrating data and weather into the storytelling is, is getting more popular, too. And I think it's the value too, right? You, I, I don't mind if it's a branded entertainment place if I'm getting value. Yep. And then the, the, the last piece, and this is more, again, kind of future forward, you know, we start to see what's happening with, you know, with Google Glass. We start seeing what's happening with augmented reality. Um, this is already happening. You know, it, for those of you, I mean, a few years ago, Yelp, um, as you know, I'm sure everyone's familiar with Yelp and restaurant reviews and everything else. Uh, they introduced the thing called Monocle uh, as part of their app. And it was a bit of an Easter egg. When they first launched it, you had to shake your phone and the Monocle button would appear. Uh, and when you hit it, uh, it would activate the iPhone's camera. And then wherever you were, you could face the camera and it would pull the data in from their restaurant reviews. And so if you were standing right in front of a restaurant, it would pull those reviews for you to, to tell you exactly what people thought before you went in. So, this idea of integrating uh, data and overlaying it uh, from real world scenarios, people are starting to do that. There's, a, you know, there's been some great functions within Google Maps where you, know, you can turn on the Wikipedia plugin 
and start to learn about everything around you because it pulls all the Wikipedia entries based on, on the locations around you too. So great elements to, to add to storytelling and, and create different stories. That's uh, everything. Fantastic, thank you. So we wanted to leave some time for Q&A from the audience too. Uh, obviously I've been asking Matt some questions as we go, but does anyone have any questions? This lady here first. Oh, <laughs> do you need this mic? Oh no, there's one there. No, have a mic. <laughs> Hi, that was a really great presentation. Um, I have a question. Just, uh, I, I'm curious to know what your advice would be. I have, I have the brand. The money's there. It's American. Um, it's a, it's a brand that understands real people doing real things, right? And authenticity. The messaging is going to be social. It's going to be about uh, mental health. What do you recommend? I do or we do if our background is really only advertising or you know documentary production. Good question. Um, I, I think the a couple things. I think if, you know it, it is going to be social. I think the the first thing I would do um, is if you haven't got one already, is sign up for a social monitoring service. So that I means there's a number of, uh, of companies out there that will uh, monitor conversations happening online. Mm -hmm. um, and I think you can get, that will give you a sense of the types of conversations that are happening that are relevant to what you're trying to talk about. And I think you can pull those consumer insights of what, what are you know, real people talking about that's re relevant to your subject matter, which might help you craft more storylines or see what some of the, the trending topics are that you might want to create content around. Um, I think the, the other thing that's, uh, that's a free tool out there too is uh, Google has Google Insights. Um, and that will tell you what popular searches are. And you can, again, you can start to bucket a, a bit of a content strategy, again, based on what people are, the language people are actually using. I think that might be uh, an interesting place to start because it is, it is rooted in uh, fact, so that if, you know, depending on you know yourselves and, and the client, you can go to them saying, "Hey, here's here's what's actually happening in the space." So let's uh, let's let's address this. That, that, I would start there, um, and I think then you know, you'll, you'll I think the social monitoring tool will also tell you where these conversations are happening, um, and then that'll give you an idea of how to, what, what ecosystem to create, because that type of content may be more relevant in, in some platforms than others, depending on where people are, are wanting to have this conversation. Does it, I mean, are we thinking sort of outside these geo borders? I mean, I, I don't, I simply don't think that something that is American is limited in that space. And particularly with this shoe company, I don't think they would want to either. So um, being Canadian, like being Canadian in working, you know, in this, in that space, do you, do you sort of look at, all of North America, or do you do sort of world surveys on this type of thing when you're looking at these um, social monitoring services? Yeah, I mean, I mean, the, the beauty of, of all these services is, you know, the social web. Right, the social web is the social web, and, and these things, these conversations happen globally, absolutely. Um, but you know, given, depend, it depends on where the brand exists and where they want to tell these stories you can actually narrow down your search to, okay, I just want to understand what's happening in the US or in North America, so I make sure that I'm creating content for this audience. Because again, not knowing the subject matter that you're, you're leaning towards, um, it might be a very different conversation culturally. Um, so you want to understand those nuances from place to place. And you know, we, we do a lot of work with, with global brands, um, and there's, there's a lot of nuances. You know, how you connect with people in Asia versus North America, or, you know, Africa or South America is all very different. There's another question. Uh, I think up here first, then I'll come back to you and you. Could you tell us how Chipotle linked Farmed and Dangerous back to their brand? Uh, how it linked, well, it, it, not explicitly through the content. I mean, because of the subcontext of the whole messaging, which linked back to their wider, um, you know, wider message of uh, sustainable 
agriculture. It then, you know, by the by, led back to uh, Chipotle. And they've done similar content plays, but I mean, I, I don't know the company in terms of a rise of, you know, uh, products sold, for example, uh, but I certainly th know that the brand uh, saw a dramatic increase based on that, uh, based on that series. Yeah, and I think, I mean, from a, I think it's probably more from a media angle too, in a lot of cases, brands will create this type of content because they're trying to find a way to engage with their audience on a more regular basis. So, you know, Chipotle is a daily engagement. It is something that you know, people can go eat there every day as, as, as part of the lunch. So, you know, in order to stay top of mind, creating more uh, episodic content gives people a reason to engage with the brand mm -hmm. and keep it top of mind. And they can run, the, and I think because they own the content, uh, they can run that content on, you know, paid distribution services, but they can also run it on their own social media mm -hmm. platforms and their own website, again, to kind of reach people that want to engage with the brand. And the good thing about, you know, Chipotle, again, is an example, but the notoriety that you get from a web series like that, you know, the PR, the press, the coverage, that all goes on to increase, right, their exposure. I mean, they must have been recognized. It, it, you know, even their integration into events, right? Uh, question down here. What's this chap here? Thank you. Chap, sorry, I'm so British sometimes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, great presentation. Thank you very much for that. Um, the, the video content marketing is really relevant to what I'm doing. But I also wanted to ask you about photography. Is, brand, is there such a thing as photo branded content or is that advertising? Um, also, you guys didn't really answer the question of who is the best person to approach when approaching a brand. Is it the brand itself or the CMO? Uh, sorry, the creative agency, the, mark, you know, the media agency. What would the, be the best initial contact? I'm sure they'll send you to who you need to talk to after you contact them. Um, so, yeah, I, 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 well, the first question, so absolutely, I mean, you're looking at photo content. Um, yeah, I kind of glossed over it when we talked about the GSP. Like, there, there was, we created a book around that, and, and, you know, part of, we actually have an art buying uh, few people on our team as well that, uh, that handle that. So actually, you know, photography, and anything that is content, it absolutely can be, uh, can be branded, and it's not doesn't have to be just advertising because you can end, you know you can self publish and, and and do galleries and do these things. Um, the the other question, I mean, I, I don't I don't want it's not a cop out when I say it, it depends. It really does depend on on what your angle is. Um, I would say the 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 easiest answer is whoever has the most trusted relationship with the decision maker, and I think mm. uh, you know. CMO, unless you have a relationship with a CMO or a VP marketing that, that extends beyond you trying to pitch them something, you're, you're, they're friends or they're, you're, they're acquaintances through something, it's going to be really hard to get to them. Um, and even, I mean, even for, I mean, even for us, we have a, you know, we've got very senior people at, you know, pre the presidents and partners of Sid Lee, who you know, is a well-respected agency, they can't get on the agenda of, of people as well. We're trying to pitch our business, so it is, it's a tough one for sure. Um, so it, you know, it tends to be, I think the creative agency is probably the easier way in. And, and again, depending on your angle, you can talk to, you know, there's account people who run the accounts, there's the, the creative teams who, who come up with the ideas, and then there's the, the strategy and planning people who, who look at the insights. That's probably the, the spaces to, to start with. Um, the media agencies will want to know numbers. So unless, unless you've got, you know, a million, a million views a month on something you're doing online, you're going to get put on the you know, stack of other pictures on their desk that they'll wait when it's relevant. That's the benchmark, isn't it? A million, right? In, Can in Canada, you know, if you're running a web property, unless you're getting a million uniques a month, the media agency is probably not going to pay attention. Uh, we had another question right now. Yep. Oh. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, folks. Uh, great presentation. Um, I've been reading a lot of Craig Vaynerchuk recently. Uh, so anyone in the room who's interested in uh, branded um, content should probably check out a book called Jab, Jab, Right oh, Hook. Gary. Gary, sorry. Gary Vaynerchuk. Yes, yes, yeah, yes, I'm yes, reading yes. it right now. Good, it's a good it's in one. my bag over there. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> and, and one of the things he talks about later on in the book is he talks about when he's talking about social media platforms specifically, he talks about how you know we have already entrenched social media platforms, but one of the ideas as a content creator and working with brands is looking at like up and coming social media platforms and kind of jumping on board as, as soon as you see it relevant mm -hmm. to what it is that you're doing. 
And I guess my question to both of you is, what are your favorite new social media platforms? <laughs> Trend jacking, I think that's what he coined it, didn't he? Yeah, Which, so. of course, is another, you know, it's important to a brand. If you get there, f you know, sometimes when you can get there first, like with the Oculus, and you can, you know, it's, you've got that innovative edge, which people will respond to. Uh, well, we talked about virtual reality, of course, um, being one area which I think you have to be looking at. Yeah, I mean, I think the, you know, the, the, the place, because my role is digital innovation, you know, it's, I spend a lot of time digging into all these different uh, platforms because inevitably a client's going to ask my point of view and I need to have one. Um, so I, you know, kind of I start there. And I think for me, I like to look at the, how people are behaving in those spaces to really get a sense of what they're all about. You, you know, it's it's interesting when you look at Instagram. Um, you know, Instagram has really caught on to be this fashion luxury type of platform. You still can't buy advertising on it in Canada. Um, so all the brands that are that are on there, I think the ones that are doing well are in that kind of fashion and, 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 and luxury space. I mean, Mercedes just hit, I think, a million followers on, on Instagram. So that's, it's getting pretty well established there. I think, you know, Pinterest has established itself as that kind of, you know, that, that home decor and that, I mean, honestly, it's like the W network. It's female online. skewed, right? Yeah, it is absolutely yeah. female skewed. It is, it is the W network. It is home decor and travel and aspirational. The stuff you would put on your fridge yeah. is what it is. And again, they don't offer advertising in Canada, but you can buy advertising in the U.S. So, I think there's a lot of things, you know, Vine is another one, I mean, six second videos. Um, there's, there's a great opportunity to, to do some really cool stuff in that space. And I think um, there's a couple ways to look at it from, uh, from a brand standpoint and how to get into these ones. Um, there's, uh, you, know, you call it the signal versus noise ratio. Playing out. <laughs> Speaking of signal versus noise. Um, <laughs> But you know you can stand like on Vine right now as a brand you can stand out because not a lot of brands are on there and as long as you're doing interesting stuff you can kind of you know you can get out there. Instagram is getting flooded with with brands so to you know you got to now start now market your Instagram account to get followers so it's um, I think if you got a brand that wants to take chances they can try some of those new ones I think Tinder people mm -hmm. are playing with um, as, you know again it works for certain brands it can be uh, an interesting one. But again, though, you have to be incredibly careful as a as a brand if you're going onto these platforms, yeah, right? It, doesn't work for all it, it really doesn't. So, that kind of, you kind of answered your question. Yeah, I think you were looking for new platforms, but well, you know, augmented reality, virtual reality. Yeah, there was. I mean, I mean, Tinder thing. The other thing again, kind of back to the consumer behavior. It's, it's creating this swipe left, swipe right type yeah. of easy behavior. So again, people are incorporating that, that swiping mechanism into how to en engage with brands because that's kind of what people are, are teaching themselves. It was actually, Tinder was used in a political campaign in Toronto, which I thought was quite amusing. There was a young candidate that put his profile up on Tinder and, and kind of pitched himself that way. That uh, He was very successful, actually, apparently. I wasn't on it. So we heard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, next question. Hey guys, hello. Um, yeah, the thing that really resonated with me the most, Amy, was uh, the last thing you said pretty much on stage as you did in your presentation was, I don't mind if I'm being sold to as long as I'm getting value. That so. is exactly, and I, I mean, and you might have a different opinion, do you? I mean, do no, you, no, I the, totally agree. Yeah, there's people. I mean, you know, we we've kind of been grilled a little bit over the last few yeah, days. Yeah, yeah. Of, we were grilled <laughs> yesterday live, but, but you know about whether it was abhorrent to have branded content and whether it, you know it, we should just it should be banned altogether but I, I firmly believe in that statement i think if there's value there then yeah it's, i'm fine yeah so my question is uh what are some broad categories of value that uh, audiences will experience broad categories of value uh well the storytelling is one i mean if you're immersed like any good film or content if you're enjoying the narrative, if it's giving you the value of humor, entertainment is the word, you know, then that's really one value exchange uh, right there and then. Um, I'm just trying to think. I, I think actual... we, you know, we, from a brand standpoint, I think you know, two of the main areas that we look at, um, there's emotional value. So there, there's an emotional connection. There's a reason to... Sorry, you cut out my mic. <laughs> We good? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so yeah, the emotional uh, value, and then there's also functional. And I think you know, if, if you're trying to look in those two categories of emotional versus functional, there tends to be a way for 
a brand to provide value to, whether whether it's a storyline or an, or an app or, or whatever those those pieces are. You know, and just going back, you know, Audi was a classic example where that came into the real world experience. You know, you got to drive the Audi for 24 hours. How phenomenal is that? You know? Uh, one more. I think we've got time for one more. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for today. Do you have any tips for writers? Tips for writers? Um, um, can you just I expand e a little? Yeah. Um, I'm happy to work as a writer for hire. Um, I have enough creative projects that I develop on my own. I don't really want to get into the whole creating of this, but I have done this work before, and I would like to do more as a writer for hire. Do I just approach the creative agencies? Yes. Okay. okay. Yeah. yeah. One mic. <laughs> um, no, I, th I think, I mean, absolutely. I think mm -hmm. there, again, and we even heard the question earlier today, there's a lot of advertising agencies that know how to write ad copy, mm -hmm. you know, to write headlines and, and, and TV scripts, but they're not the best storytellers. So they're often looking for uh, those people in the space to, to bring in. And we've certainly done, as we, you know, as we kind of build our, our social media teams, we build our content teams, we are bringing people in from, uh, you know, for, uh, from outside that specialize in this and, and hiring them. So they're, I put your book, I mean, depending on your body of work, I'm sure you've got a book and a portfolio, organize it by the type of work that you, you want to do and, yeah, and get to the creative directors. Mm -hmm. Are you based here? Yeah. yeah. So yeah, target them exactly. Um, I th and, well, actually, uh, just on that, I mean, I don't think geography restricts you. Um, I think there's a, you know, this this is a growing space. I think. Yeah, yeah. I guess it'd be easy to, for you to work with people and uh, career directors in any city. And I think that's all we've got time for. Unless, okay, yes, that is. Thanks so much. <laughs> Thanks.